information as to the, the process today. We're going to have uh, Chris Mitchell, our executive director from First Service, will be reviewing the, the actual budget like, like last time. We will then open it to questions from our finance advisory committee and anyone from the, um, uh, the board can uh, jump in after the presentation is completed. And then at the very end, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Now on your uh, responses to the budget, make sure that they're specific budget orientated questions and uh, try to keep your uh, concerns to uh, a time of uh, three minutes. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Chris and Chris, I think is gonna be introducing the, uh, uh, the members of our FAC committee. Welcome everyone, and ladies and gentlemen who are live watching this at home, uh, we're gonna try to continue having these meetings live when we have them. Uh, but I would like the fact to introduce themselves, and Steve, can you start off first, please? Yeah, good morning. Uh, I'm Steve Von Wright. I live on Copper Creek Drive. Good morning, Donald Dang, Laguna Seca. Complaint. We don't have to know that. Yeah. Howard Katz. Gary Burkle, Laguna Seca. Uh, Gina Monaco, Myrtle Beach, on, on the uh, Financial Advisory Committee. Dory Gardsky, Spanish Trail Cove. Test, test, test. Sharon Robinson. Ron Varner, I'm the advisor to the Finance Advisory Committee. Ron Mitchell with the Finance, Finance Advisory Committee. I'm not on. Okay, that was Ron Mitchell. We're having some, already starting off with some technical difficulties, but it's okay, we're going to overcome this. Okay, thank you everyone. So ladies and gentlemen, where we continue from the last meeting, the, uh, we had three directors. Thomas will be here shortly. Uh, this presentation is geared to what happened uh, from the last time we met. Then we'll have planning and compliance, uh, operations, maintenance, and then food and beverage topics. So let's start with, come on. Boy, this is technical. Okay. So you might remember this, uh, this is just the change from based on draft four of the annual budget for the cost or expense or department categories, from restaurant and lounge to golf operations. Uh, right now we have an increase um, planned in this iteration of the budget, budget four of an increase uh, at $6.67. Uh, an increase of 1.98% year over year. Again, this is an updated budget <laughs> expense by category. So we see what the assessments, non-assessments, golf, bar, lounge, and for the income, I'm sorry, and then for the expenses, uh, one of our largest one, of course, is the labor component, salaries and benefits, followed by outside services. Bulk internet cable, and then of course our repair and replace contribution. Now, some of the biggest changes that happened uh, over uh, in draft four. Uh, we received responses from the RFP that was uh, released, and the board is negotiating uh, right now uh, to make a choice on the vendor. Uh, community patrol contract in the budget, though, was reduced roughly about 116000 from budget 2022 to budget 2023 based on the responses that we received. Uh, credit card processing was also reduced uh, based on the association's um, uh, transition to a new credit card processor uh, that will reduce our credit card processing fees from an 8 to 9% to a 3 3.3 to 3.5, I believe Jason said at the last meeting. Uh, First Service has offered not to take a management fee increase for 2023. 
Uh, First Service has maintained the, the same fee at the 2020 level. So uh, for the, this will be the third year that this, uh, First Service has not uh, proposed an increase in the management fee. Uh, that, that effectively is a $16,937 decrease in budget for that line item. Uh, also, there will be no increase in the payroll factor fee. Uh, that will still remain at that eight, roughly 8% 8 uh, that's in the contract. The proposed golf rates, based on discussion we had at the last meeting with Brian, uh, changing some of the rates for the homeowners, guests, uh, and that will be, we'll be rolling that new worksheet out uh, for the golf rates. But with that change, that roughly 10,000 of additional golf revenue. Uh, then we also eliminated, uh, based on feedback, eliminated the movies under the stars from the recreation budget, uh, that's a savings of $5,000. So first now we're going to go through our department. Uh, oh, correct. The 2022 budget was 328,000 mm -hmm. and we've got uh, uh, 340,000 mm -hmm. in draft four. Right. That's an increase of $12,000. Right. So the management fee component, remember, is the 15,000 roughly. That's then under there is the processing for payroll, $4,557 a month. There's also the communication fee, so some of those fees are still in there. And remember, the board approved the mailing increase, the cost of mailing because of the post office increase in stamps, et cetera. That increase is in there, but the base management fee is remaining the same. So there's several components that roll up into that management line item. Thank you. Okay, so. As we did before, I'm going to just give a brief introduction to the department, give some highlights, and then I'm going to let that department leader uh, give you some in-depth what's happening in the department, and then I'll allow you some um, uh, questions for them. And then, so right now we're starting with planning compliance. The biggest line items within uh, Etanisla's budget is labor, um, the cost of supplies for the car, for um, paperwork, et cetera. Um, and so uh, recruitment, as you, a theme that uh, you've heard me through these budget meetings is that as we lose staff, uh, the cost of the new staff, the, the uh, prevailing wage, so to speak, that is right now in the market where everyone is looking for service level, qualified service level personnel, it's been a little difficult and that has been driving up the starting wages to recruit new people. Uh, we've lost some people in Etanisa's department and we have recruited, but that is pushing those wages up. And so that is one of the largest changes that we've seen. And this is not a merit increase. This is not a, uh, just a cost of living increase. This is, we have to pay this new staff member this amount in order to get them into the door. Um, so with that and some of the changes that we're seeing in insurance, workers comp year over year, uh, Etanisa's department uh, labor costs increased 15856 uh, She's been very frugal with her supplies and vehicle expense, and so there was a small reduction in that. And so her net increase in her department is 15031 So Etanisa, why don't you give us an update of what else is happening within the department? Good morning, everyone. So to be short, as some folks know that I can be long-winded, <laughs> <laughs> we will be maintaining the current staff levels for my department. So planning and compliance will remain myself as manager plus three staff members. And my three staff members are cross-trained with each other. So while I have a dedicated application specialist, he can assist with parking citations and general violations. My violation specialist can assist with applications and filling out items for the architectural committee. 
My parking specialist can help with general violations and with applications. So my department is cross-trained with each other to maximize our availability to the residents. Regarding the vehicles, so everyone has seen the little Chevrolet Sparks that we have, and they are hybrid vehicles. They are also end of life in that should a major item, major repair be required, at that time we would be looking at replacing the vehicle outright. But for right now, for this year and next, as long as they're moving, we're going to move them. <laughs> so you, you will see us use the Chevrolet Sparks as we drive around the community. Please don't throw eggs at us. They're, they're, once those eggs bake, it is hard to get off the paint. But uh, we are going to continue with the vehicles we have now. Um, COVID forced us to be very frugal on how we prepare and use our supplies, be it paper or otherwise. And we have continued moving that forward. So items that we used to outsource, um, such as our permit cards, such as our painting pamphlets, we now print those on demand in-house. So those initial savings we continue to use forward. We will not be outsourcing those items again. Um, it just doesn't make the financial sense when we can make them on demand and adjust them on demand here within the, within the administration office. But that's pretty much the long and short of my department's update. We're going to keep on keeping on, uh, doing the best we can with what we have. And we're going to continue driving those sparks and, until the sparks say we can't drive anymore. <laughs> so, is there any questions from the board or FAC pertaining to um, planning compliance? <laughs> Not no. yet. You can leave your microphones on during this so that. We can easily get to, you can easily get to them. There you go. Thank you. Um, in, in regards to your cross training, that's really great. I like that idea. Have you also gone through your department and looked at um, the idea of doing a time study to see if you can improve on how quickly something is done by using a different method we're always looking at ways to streamline the process. Certain items, certain tasks are hard-baked in the CCNRs and the general statement. It has to be done a certain way because of how it interfaces with the committees. But as far as items that are department only, um, yes, we are always looking at ways to streamline them. The problem with having, attempting to have a sit down time study, that is something I did try to do. All it takes is one person with one quick question and the clock is broken. <laughs> so unless we have a way to isolate certain staff members to have a dedicated day, um, it's going to be catch as catch can be. Um, we did try that shortly after the COVID lockdowns eased of having a dedicated day. And what we found very vigorously is that the expectation of the community is that when the office doors are open, all our doors are open. And the idea of having a set day for staff members to do set processes did not interface well. So we're still, we're still looking to find a balance between availability and uh, lockdown time, to be, to be rough about it. It's a work in progress. So does your department then have more of its time spent interacting with the residents as opposed to um, using the computer and printing out form letters, that type of a thing? The answer to that question literally, literally varies by the day of the week. If we have just had an architectural committee meeting, we're going to have a lot of residents on the phone or in the office asking for an update. Um, if it is the day before an architectural meeting, we're likely to have very few people in the office looking for my staff and we can focus more on uh, paperwork and computer time. 
So the, the cycles of the Master Architectural Committee, the Golf Advisory Committee, and to a lesser extent, the Board of Directors, their meeting cycles are a big driver of when we're immediately available for residents or when we have to respond an hour or even a day after they dropped off their request. All right. Okay, say okay. Thank you. Uh, Dory, one, that's a good question because Randy uh, is also proposed looking at, I'm putting Randy on the spot. I'm not gonna look at him, but I'm gonna put him on the spot. Uh, looking at the, the uh, phone system because uh, our phone system is a little archaic. Modern phone system have a customer service platform that can tell how many calls came into that department, how was it answered, was a voicemail left, uh, was it picked up, and how long did the conversation occur? That's something Randy and I have talked about. It's, it's something we need to go because that will also then better uh, track and demonstrate what's happening uh, on the phone because there's a lot of, oh, no one answers the phone, I've called, no one's left a message, so we haven't seen it. But what is what the proof of it? My word against someone else's. So a system that can track all that would, I think, be beneficial to see where are, are we being effective on the phones. That would be one segment of your question. And that would also relate to tracking of the form letters that you have to constantly print out and send. Does the computer have a listing of that at the end of the month? So you could say, I did 380. Actually, that's a the platform connect uh, system that we use for first service. Mm -hmm. Does keep track of those. In, so the phone system would track one thing. The letters and everything are tracked through connect, which is software uh, for writing the letters, sending out the citations, violations. All right, thank you. Thomas, you can sit down. Right. Okay. Any other questions from regarding planning and compliance? Okay, with that then, we're going to, thank you, Atenisa, we're gonna move on to uh, operations maintenance. So Mark Schleiden, the director of maintenance operations, uh, he's done a great job um, twisting the arm of vendors. Uh, the, uh, to the point of many of his contracts are gonna remain the same as 2022. Uh, in his line items, he did have a reduction, a major reduction was in the uh, water features and street sweeping, produced a savings of about 50,000 to 55. Now labor costs are planned to increase roughly 18,352. As in this budget, we're moving a part-timer position to a full-time position. And uh, so there's an additional cost for that. Also, as I alluded to earlier, a reduction of community patrol line items saved 149,000 from his actual to budget for the 2022. And so we are, uh, that was a change also in the budget line items that we'd had uh, previously in draft three. So with that, Mark, what else is happening within your department? As you stated, um, taking that one part-time position to a full-time position will give me three maintenance techs. Um, other than that, with the uh, full-time assistant, that's pretty much it. And as spelled out, the reduction in a couple of those items. But overall, um, as stated as well, holding these vendors to their current uh, cost from uh, past year. I think janitorial was the only one that went up, what, 4%? Um, pool service. Patrol, obviously, we reduced, and landscaping. Um, the current schedule is at the same level. Of course, we'll be going out for an RFP um, within the next month, month and a half for that. Any questions? I have one. Okay. One second. Dan Howard. Yes, it takes me a while to find buttons. Um, <clears throat> the 149000 that were saved, is that a cut in price or a reduction in service and what services are reduced? We, it is a reduction in service as well. It is, uh, you want to take that? I'm sorry. it's the reduction of call center from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. But we've taken that cameras and we relocated them to the front desk. So that individual now it's at the gate will also be monitoring the cameras. So we feel good in that move. Um, cameras are still being viewed. And also, we dropped one patrol. Um, so there is a reduction in service. 
Yes, Dan. Use your microphone. Do you have under uh, equipment repairs? Do you have forty thousand for that? I'm sorry. You have thirty-five thousand for that, and then down under. Uh, well, we'll just go. Uh, electrical repairs is eighteen thousand. How much is that all going to be under two thousand dollars per episode? What I'm asking is, is there, is there a possibility that some of that really should be categorized into reserve repair and replacement activities? There might be, Dan. Uh, one thing that I've seen working with Mark is that there are many little things that are separate, so they add up that um, an electrician may come out and he's going to fix the breaker at the South Clubhouse. Then he comes over and fixes an issue here. So you look at the invoice and you say, well, that's, uh, that's one vendor, but the, there, are many, there are many little parts. And so some may be over 2000 uh, but a lot of it is under that amount. There's just several things with this aging community, and Mark can probably talk more to that, is that we just have to fix and, and upkeep. Okay. Mark's Any had a lot questions? of fun with drains this year. Uh, yeah, in, I mean, just buildings. the infrastructure of the community is, uh, it's aging. So things are becoming more expensive. But uh, like I said, trying to do as much in-house and get the lowest price on the outsource. I've got another question. Yeah. You said the protection Please use your microphone. You're, we're filming this I'm so we sorry. need the audience to hear. Thank you. Uh, this isn't my best, so tell me if I'm not getting through. Um, you're saying that the protection is going down because of fewer people? That is correct. The community patrol contract that currently stands, the board is working with that vendor to, first of all, appoint the vendor, and then there is a reduction in some services to reduce that by 149,344. Uh, My minor says 158,44, but that's okay. We got two different papers. If, if I remember, we had a reduction in service, but they also had a reduction in their actual bid. That is correct. Okay. Actually, they held the line on their bid. Okay, so they. So can we it. say that they charged, uh, uh, they overcharged us last year because we got competitive bids? No. That would be incorrect. We were not overcharged. Even though they're lowering it with all you're talking about, cost of wages and everything, you do not think that they overcharged us last year, uh, because I know here with Bob that we got a number of competitive bids. Did we do that last year? No, we did not go out to bid last year. Quick question. Mark? Yes. So you're, you're adding an additional, well, going from a part-time to full-time staff member, are you going to be in a better position to manage a preventative maintenance program in the aging structure that we're dealing with? Is that going to be specifically drains it, it's still at this point we're just fighting fires um, to say that I've got the ability to do preventative maintenance would still be um, that would not be true we're I mean, not to there. go up and check equipment prior I mean we are basically fire to fire um, and with like I said currently two staff members now one calls in sick one's on vacation you know I've got daily duties that have to be done you know and that's the doggy stations that's trash cans that's Plant, it, it goes on and on, their daily duties, and then I start mixing in, you know, changing out lights in the ballroom and drinking fountains at the clubhouses and showers and toilets and this and this and this. Um, preventative maintenance is, we're not there yet, yeah. and, and I don't know that we would ever be, but we're just staying on top of things um, for the most part. And, and these vendors, too, some things are still a ways out. Um, you know, we've been waiting on this drinking fountain at the end of the hallway by rec. Um, you know, that, that's going on two and a half months, and, and parts are still scarce. Um, vendors are still scrambling to get help. So things are still lagging behind, but seem to be catching up of some sort. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I would like to address the uh, street sweeping issue, and maybe you can elaborate after I, I comment, is that earlier in the year, we had some complaints about the street sweeping, 
that basically they were just spreading mud all over and creating a mess rather than cleaning up our streets. So after we received those complaints, the board decided to uh, uh, temporarily halt that in, in June. I believe quality street sweeping was who we contracted with. We stopped that in June for the rest of this year to see whether or not uh, uh, we could come up with another solution or whether we really even needed that service. The savings was, uh, uh, the annual thing was 28.4, so the savings was, uh, you know, 14,200, you know, to us to eliminate that service. But since then, we've had some complaints about, uh, you know, there's been leaves in the gutter and some of the streets do need to be cleaned up in certain areas. So what uh, Mark has done, uh, I believe, and you can elaborate, is that we've assigned uh, uh, artistic maintenance to go to those areas. And if anyone has any specific complaints, please contact Mark so he can assign artistic maintenance to go clean that up now. Uh, in the future, we may actually set up a, a schedule. Maybe you can elaborate how that's going to work. Okay, I spoke with, um, Bob and I have discussed this a, a number of times. Um, this morning I reached out to Artistic Maintenance. Their mow schedule in the winter months is every two weeks. The grow rate obviously slows down. So I reached out to Artistic for no additional cost. If I could get two of their hands uh, for 16 hours a week, with my additional full-time position, if that is approved and goes forward, we would be able to put three, we would have 24 hours a week on the gutters. The problem with quality sweeping that we had was that once they reduced the water usage, we were just spreading mud. Um, it did, you know, when it in dry locations, it was fine. But where we had current water standing, um, they created a bigger mess than they actually cleaned. Um, so that was board decision. We reduced that. Um, with artistic going forward, um, we'll be able to receive the calls, and, and we we see the the areas that it's most impacted. And you know, last week I was on Glen Eagles um, doing some cleanup over there in the gutter. Country Club right now is an absolute mess. So these locations on the north side, we've got a couple locations that consistently hold water. Um, I think it's a step in the right direction. Is it a complete save all? That's to be seen. But we will be able to throw some resources at specific locations on the street sweeping. Thank you. Mark, you said they're not charging us for that? No, they will not be charging us. Awesome. Artistic. So. <laughs> yes, Howard. Uh, Mark, are you in charge of utilities also? I am not. That was under the administration piece of it. Right. That was last week's or last meeting's item. So landscaping falls under your domain, correct? Landscaping does, Howard. Okay. I have a question on landscaping portion. We can't hear you, Howard. How about that? There you go. I have a question on landscaping on page five. The whole landscaping budget seems to be $500,000, uh, yet it's added in twice that expense by taking a portion of the golf course maintenance and moving it to landscaping. So the question then is, the Greenbelt allocation, which is a million one fifty-six, uh, is 34.54 plus percentage of the total golf course maintenance is 34.54 percent just throw it against the wall and 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 pick a number or is this a realistic number and should that really fall under the golf course instead of landscaping since it's two and a half times the landscaping budget is taking golf course maintenance and sliding it across and it seems to skew the real cost of golf course maintenance. Please address that. So that's, that is one perspective that it could be skewing the numbers. The study was done, of, I think Jack Sidwell was on the board many years ago, before you and I were here, Howard, and uh, the board did an analysis of areas surrounding the golf course that would be considered 
shared or a common area not related to the golf course. And that's where the number, that percentage was arrived at of how much of the golf courses relates to common area that somebody has a bench, somebody can sit there, enjoy some green space and not interfere with golf. And so that's how the percentage came up. Uh, the allocation then was built uh, to, to allocate a portion of those areas, though that golf course maintenance maintains, relates to common area and areas that both Mark Schleiden and Mark Birchfield need to keep an eye on because that is the area, again, benches, people walking, their dogs walking uh, with themselves, biking, that uh, have a sit down on the grass. That was determined many years ago that that represented a common area like a park and should therefore be um, recorded under uh, the landscape piece in the HOA's budget. That's the methodology of how it was arrived at and their purpose for it. Okay, but accepting that, the things that you've said, areas where people can walk their dogs and sit down on the grass, et cetera, et cetera, uh, can that actually happen? Can people actually be on those areas? And so I'll give you an example, right near gate three, as you drive in, there's some benches between hole two and three. That, those are areas for sitting and everything that can be used for um, uh, you know, a common area. Um, hole nine, as you're uh, crossing over, uh, there's a bench there. So there are areas that are under the maintenance purview of golf course maintenance that are shared with common area that people can use that are not golfing. Okay. There are on the golf course. many <laughs> areas that make up this green belt thing. Mm -hmm. And is there any way to figure out what those areas are so that they can be used by other than golfers? I mean, we can go back and pull the, the maps from the original designation, but you're, you're, you can look at it where there's benches and everything on the golf course area, those are the areas that are considered in that green belt allocation. Okay, except from where I reside, those are pretty far away. So is there anything I would suggest closer to where some other folks live that uh, are usable? So maybe a map would be beneficial if you could forward that to me sometime. Thank you. Any other further questions of Mark? Any last words, Mark? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> who, is the, who is the deity that is responsible for the utilities? Who do we question? So you would question uh, myself then. What questions do you have on that, Dan? Electricity is going down by 46,000. <coughs> Correct. Based on that estimate we have, and this is one area that we may have to address based on the new information we received from the city of Banning. And that's where Bob and Randy are trying to meet with the city manager and Art Vela to get a better handle on what the city is doing. Uh, but, you know, it, we had budgeted 417. We were coming in at the, now I'm gonna use Sharon's metric of the annualized at uh, 350,000. And that's where there was a, a, a reduction in the budget year over year from 417 to 371 to be in line where where we think next year will be. The caveat being though, we were just surprised by this new information that was mailed to homeowners. I mentioned the last board meeting and we need to get a better hold of what the city is doing. So that may change. Yeah, the gas category, is that? Now the gas, that uh, has to go up. We've uh, actually seen an increase in those rates and so we are going to have to increase. That's a 13,000 year over year in natural gas. Who uses that gas? That's going to be the buildings, the kitchen, uh, all common area buildings for heat, uh, admin building, um, clubhouses are going to use that as well. Uh, I think the pool, yeah, the pools are in there as well. Um, so that is the natural gas for the common area. Um, 
I think golf course just has it for their building back in there under golf course. But this will be the rest of the common area. Okay. Is, I don't remember if uh, maintenance has a, the golf course maintenance has a line in there for the gas for the vehicles. Is that where the gas for planning and compliance would also be? Yes, it would be under there as well because they would fill up over there. Okay, ready for the next item. We're going to go on to food and beverage. Um, so combined budget increase, this is for uh, restaurant and lounge. Combined uh, budget increase is expected to be 84047 Now the combined revenue is expected to increase by 202000 roughly. Um, this is based on expected price increases in 2023, not only with food, but also on the um, bar side. Now, labor costs are the biggest driver here, uh, increasing 222000 um, Again, we've seen here the market for cooks uh, has really pushed up some of these, uh, the wages. Um, you know, one thing I'll use Sharon's discussion is uh, the majority of time when we do a budget for a uh, restaurant, we use the percentages. Uh, in here, we have budgeted for the year a worst case scenario of 100% of people are working on the weekly hours, and that's how we arrive at that budget. So there is a little different. The normal methodology for a restaurant would be you got to hit the target based on the revenue. Um, cost of goods sold is also expected to increase by 71000 to 73. We're seeing a higher uh, cost come through. But that's also them pushing up the revenue as well. I also did a, got a, again, shout out to Sharon because she's doing PowerPoint presentations. I got to keep up with her. And so one of the things we have is a, a graph I did of kind of demonstrating the restaurant, uh, the average sales that we have by meal period, a meal period being an hour from 7 a.m., 8 a.m., all the way to 9 to 10. And you see the strongest point, I think Ajit will like this too, because I'm doing graphs like he's also said he wants to see more graphs. Um, you see the biggest thing, uh, breakfast has not been a, uh, a winner. It's more, again, it, it's, a, it's a good, uh, Beverly, it's good to have breakfast there for the people who enjoy it, but it's not really where the revenue is being um, driven. It's not where, it's really lunch, and that spikes around between 11 and 1, Spiking between 12 and 1 is really our high point. Then our dinner, and our dinner, you know, starts at 4, and we see a, a, an increase up. 5, about 7 o'clock, it starts petering out. And so this is good as, as we plan, and the next slide I'm going to talk about, why are you showing me this graph? I, I know people eat lunch, I know people eat dinner. But there's a reason, just kind of, this is how we evaluate to see how the service level where we should be hitting. So theoretically, you should have less staff here, and Thomas agreed, you, know, you should have one or two servers at most. Lunch, you're gonna have more, and dinner service, you're gonna have even more because there's more people. And we've talked about this, I've talked about this with the fact is that there is an expectation gap. The expectation of the visitor to the restaurant to the expectation to uh, what we can provide. The service level from the, the consumer, they want immediate service, three-minute touches. I think they've talked about that it's not a committee. This is what people have expressed. They want that server touching them almost an average of three minutes or less to check on their water, check on the salt, check on anything, extra napkins. They want those people here. Now, what Thomas is having an issue with putting out that service level, and I've, again, talked about this at the back meeting, is I've got the sandwich, I've got the restaurant, I've got the lounge, veranda, pool. I'm spreading all my staffing resources and what we should be trying to do is get to say how can I be more effective let's look at our points where we're generating more revenue and that's where we should put a bunch of our staff but then there's the political side of it as well we're not serving the customer so what do we do and that that is where we partner with uh, FAC restaurant lounge committee and partner with the board so this is one again the meal period now let's look at the lounge a little different is before and after dinner, drinks are where, the, where it's at. That's where you see more people. Yes, they come in from the golf course or they're coming in for their lunch. They'll get there, they'll sit in the lounge. 
but our real harp high point is the dinner service before and service after dinner is where we're seeing a high point in um, our sales. So then, now I'll switch. Uh, let's go off to here. So now, what are some of the operational changes that were planned based on what's in the budget um, and based on this activity report? We're going to recommend that the sandwich stay open from 8 to 11. As you saw, um, we can run a separate graph for the sandwich before, set, before 8 o'clock. Three people, five people. Maria's there just talking to herself often because there's no one there in the restaurant. From 8 to 11 is where we see our, our, more, our usage. And we feel that and the proposal we're going to have is that the sandwich be open only from 8 to 11. Then lunch should be concentrated on the restaurant. What we've done is we have the sandwich open for lunch, restaurant open for lunch, you're spreading the people, and now you're putting more staff in these multiple areas. The revenue generation's not there because you should only have it consolidated, the people here, so I can serve them with less staff. But I'm and now spreading more staff there for less customer. Equation doesn't work. And so what if we did this proposal of the sandwich from 8 to 11, then concentrate lunch in the restaurant, this frees up the sandwich for private events after 11.30. This is your golf lunches. That would be the key area uh, that you would be able to say, hey, come in, wear spikes, because the floor can handle it. Uh, after your tournament, we hold up to 60 people. Also for private events that are non-golf related, maybe there's a, a club, a birthday, a, 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 a Greek dancing preparation <laughs> class, um, you know, that would free up the sandwich. Again, one of the other things I've talked about the fact is where's my money, where can I make the most money in my bar and banquets? So let's start targeting for how we can free up some areas for banquets. Uh, dinner would remain 4.30 to 8, and you've seen based on the point of sale system, the, the data we have is that after 7 o'clock, the dinner service people migrate toward the lounge after dinner drinks. Lounge and banquets should be the focus for 2023. These are the potential to generate uh, additional revenue to offset losses from the restaurant. And then the key thing here that we need to do in this environment that every um, uh, business is doing is adapting to market costs very quickly. So many menus will need to change. Pricing needs to change more frequently, uh, unfortunately, to keep up with what's happening. I, I remember talking to Chef Noy and then with Chef Chris it's great when I put in the order into Cisco, it said it was this price. I get the, the notification that, I'm sorry, that item isn't available anymore and the price has increased for this new product and we're, we're getting surprised. So that's a, an issue where we're gonna have to be um, able to adapt to these rising costs. And so with that, some of the plans that we have, I wanted to allow Thomas to give you a boots on the ground perspective of what he sees, and then I'll open it up for questions. So Thomas, go ahead. Good afternoon and good morning, I should say. Thank you. Um, you know, it's the goal to continue to push f the restaurant forward. And, you know, things are changing. You know, it, they, it, things aren't like they used to be. I see the demographics changing. I see the, um, just the, 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 I see the business really geared more towards the evenings. Um, of course, w you know, we're full service and the goal is to open everything. We've worked very hard in order to open the facilities based on our staff um, all the way, you know, I mean, as much as we can. Uh, yes, we're not open for lunch yet on Tuesdays, but the sandwich is open versus, you know, we're doing bingo buffets, we're doing now the Mexican extravaganza buffet Tuesday nights. Uh, we're doing everything that we can to generate, to bring more people in the restaurants, in the lounge, entertainment, whatever we can do. You know, I, you know, we are challenged severely, and I know a lot of you don't know that, but we are still challenged with staffing. We're challenged with, um, uh, you know, people calling off. Uh, there's days where I can't do my job because I'm on the line doing somebody else's job because there's nobody to replace that person. So, um, and that takes away, that takes away. Sometimes people say, God, we haven't seen you in so long, you know? And I said, well, and I have to explain to them that unfortunately I'm in the kitchen most of the time. 
and I'm filling in where I need to in order to keep the ball rolling. Um, but it is our goal. I do see things changing. I do handle all the banquets, and thankfully there is an influx in banquets. And this is what we do want. We want more of those. We want more banquets. We want, um, we really want to gear, you know, our, uh, our bar and lounge, the expansion, whatever we can do, because that's where I see the, I see the entertainment and I see the influx of people. Um, we have a lot of working people here now, and uh, they don't come out until after they get home from work. And this is why we see the change, I think, in the breakfast lunch business as it wasn't like that five years ago. So there are changes and we have to kind of roll with the punches. But we'll continue to persevere and do the very best that we can. We're blessed, we have a wonderful F&B committee that works with us side by side and helps us immensely and gives us ideas and is doing their best so we can get to where we need to be. Um, when I came here, and I've been here most a year already, believe it or not, um, this month, um, you know, I came to, it was like opening, reopening a new restaurant, and it wasn't easy. It's starting all over again, from menus to hiring, and it has been really a very, very challenging year. Yes, uh, it's, uh, it's rewarding uh, to see it move forward, but I, I don't think I've ever done anything like this in my life, and so uh, I appreciate the support. Are we perfect? No, by any means. And do we have uh, opportunities? Absolutely. But it is our goal to serve and to take care of the Sun Lakes residents and to give them a wonderful amenity where they can come and enjoy drinks and service and food within, excuse me, within the community, within this gated community. And so with that said, um, you know, we'll continue to do our best to persevere and to uh, just, uh, offer you a, a facility that you can feel comfortable to come to and enjoy uh, the camaraderie and all the, uh, and your friends and uh, the wonderful company here of the residents. I do have a comment. So glad you're back, Thomas. <laughs> um, I really like this idea of closing the sand wedge at 11.30 and opening it up to golf. Um, as a member of the Women's Golf Club here, I could see us moving our, our, our luncheon, our monthly luncheon, into the sandwich. It would easily accommodate us. We could go back to the day we want to meet on. Um, and we'd free up the ballroom for other events that need bigger space. I think it's a, a good idea, because I know I've been in the sandwich at 7.30, and it's only me. So there's really not a lot going on. It's a great place for a luncheon, or a great place for golfers to stop in for lunch after they golf, but half of them go into the lounge anyway. But it'd be a really great place, I think, for a lot of the golf clubs to be able to come in there, and then we are segueing straight into those banquets that I know everybody, banquets is where your money is, we all know that. So we can move into banquets in the sandwich and free up this ballroom for bigger banquets if we need to, because I think we can do 60 or so in the sandwich. Um, yes, so, okay, so I, I personally think that's a, a grand idea, and I also agree with the idea of consolidating. You know, you, all of us go into the lounge. I don't, I almost never eat in the restaurant, but I always eat in the lounge, and I order, because I can order off the restaurant menu in the lounge. So they're kind of one and the same in that way. So if we consolidate, it, and of course we're not gonna be able to not serve on the veranda, but consolidating like this and trying not to ex extend too much is what's gonna get us back up and running. And once we are really, really healthy, then we can look at it again. But I do like the idea of the sandwich moving over to banquets. Thank you. Yes, I'd, I'd like to make a comment. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank Thomas for all the efforts and everything that he's been putting into our community here. He's done an excellent, outstanding job and uh, we, we really appreciate it. The other thing is that I've had some complaints and concerns about the pricing. Uh, some of the people here are on fixed income, you know, we're a 35 year old community and, and some of the pricing has gone in high and high and it's almost too expensive for them. We may need to, uh, when you talk about adapt to the cost, we may also adapt to our clients here, you know, our residents and, and maybe have some half orders or half salads or something that uh, is still affordable for them, uh, you know, instead of $15 lunch, uh, you know, that, that, that's all. Maybe small small plates or something yes, like small that. small plates would, would, be, would be helpful. Huh? 
the way we could cut our costs too is just shorten that menu. Don't offer as much. Then we, then we, you know. You're exactly right, I'm sorry, I didn't mean yeah. to cut you off, but that is one thing we have talked with, uh, when Jason and I meet with the food and beverage uh, team, Chef Chris, uh, Thomas and Joseph, uh, that is one area that if things get out of hand on costs where right. I can't meet my percentage, that has to just drop off. Because we already know, number one, that's a high cost item. Number two, members probably will not pay that large amount, right. so we need to bring it. So that, has already been, I know we had that issue with one of the steak sizes. Yeah. Uh, the, the price just went, uh, I can't remember what it was, but it, it just went up out too much. And that was the cost from Cisco, the cost from Crown Meats, and they had gone up. So in that case, we will be pulling those things off because it, it's just out of reach for the clientele. Right, thank you. Considering refurbishing the sandwich to do this, because when you're talking about banquets or other private affairs in there, it's a little informal for some of the banquets, and you may want to either get rid of the bar that's in there, carpet it, change the furniture. You may want to give that serious consideration because some people may not want to go in there for a banquet it's something that is so informal. Can I answer, uh, can I, can we answer as we, you give the one question? Can I answer that question? Sure, go ahead. So, I want to make sure I'm playing by the rules, Bob. <laughs> the, I, there's not a plan to refurbish it. Now, again, it, it's geared toward people coming off the golf course, so the flooring is ideal in that case for, for them. Right. The, if we wanted to change the, 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 the chairs, we have the ability to put linens on the tables and chair covers right. to modify it to give it that, you know, uh, a better look or a different color. So without changing the chairs, the furniture, there are ways we can utilize covers uh, on the chairs, on the tables to, to get the effect of a little upscale without doing a, a remodel. Also, Mr. Katz, um, just so I know, I'm not sure if you're aware, but I do use the sand wedge even right now for events for dinner right now. I have four different districts that meet once a month and have dinner parties in there with their districts. So I'm doing 30, 40, 50 people at a time. I do the welcome home events in there. There are events, people are booking little small parties in there, and again, does it have the atmosphere? Well, maybe not for the banquet, but when we do dress it up and put linens and fix it up and dim the lighting a bit, you know, people are, seem to be happy with it. I don't have an issue, but I do use the room in the evenings. I'm doing whatever I can to utilize that empty space. Because I just realized my question was, have you given any thought to it? So I can see you've given some thought to it. Maybe we have given some thought to it, but I, I, I don't think <laughs> we, we want to go down that road. Yeah. Okay. Next. Tuesdays, um, Sandwich is open Tuesdays for lunch, and that's the only luncheon available out of any of the restaurant facilities. Mm -hmm. If you do this, are you going to continue to have Tuesday lunch in the Sandwich for everybody, or are you going to discontinue that and then discontinue Tuesday no, lunch here? I, I think we still plan to keep the Sandwich for the breakfast and the lunch, right? We do, for now, until I can get the restaurant open. Exactly. Once the restaurant's open, exactly. then we'll, roll, we'll do the same thing as we discussed, closing at 11 and then opening the restaurant. Uh, we're not far from that. Again, it's just, it's the staffing that I that I'm, need to get in place. All right, I think the, the target is that we wanted to get back to that seven days, um, or, or at least the six. We wanted one day that we could clean, um, address the restaurant, a, a day of closure so that we can address any cleaning or anything. Uh, and that would appear Monday. Monday can be the Monday night football with the lounge. Yes. Uh, and Monday could even be a breakfast <coughs> option. But we like Monday being able to address carpet, paint chips that are falling off the side and just general maintenance and not disturbing the other days that we have regular service. And so. Uh, right now, Tuesday, but I think Monday, we're, we're trying to keep Monday as a, a maintenance day for that restaurant, uh, if possible. 
Thank you. Now you had a third question. I know, but I'll pass on that third question. Um, yeah, I've, I've got a question in regards to, um, you make reference to POS data up there. Is the POS data available to the Restaurant Financial Advisory Committee? Yes, it is, and actually Sharon has put in a request for the Restaurant and Lounge Committee to get some of those reports. And so we will be providing that, and I've talked to Ron in the past and also Sharon as a FAC member that the FAC will get those copies as well. And what other committee, Sharon? I'm sorry? So what other committee? It was <laughs> Restaurant just, Lounge just, and... Just, <laughs> okay. I just want to say, I, I, I know Chris, you and I have spoken about this, and for people who... Manage a biz, looking at it more from a business perspective uh, versus you know the Sun Lakes Country Club, there you have to approach it. Where is the customer base, and serve the customer at that time? When labor is such an issue, redu reducing the hours where you're impacting the most number of customers makes the most sense. Chris, I applaud you because this is exactly what you and I were talking about. This is what needs to happen to be financially responsible with the hours and labor that we have available to us. And I know it's challenging, and I know some may not like change. They, they like to go in at 1 o'clock in the sandwich for lunch, but you can still enjoy that same wonderful lunch in the restaurant. The and lunch. we just have to be smart with the labor that's available. Right. My question is that we've budgeted, and I'm going to talk labor and I'm going to talk percents, because as you've said, restaurants run on a percent basis. If we can increase revenue, we can increase the percent needed for labor. But right now, the budget is projected with a labor percent of 87%. That is so far above an industry standard even for a country mm -hmm. club. So I guess my question is, with these proposed changes, where do you see that labor percent falling to? And would it be more in line with what we would hope it to be? So we took this into account with the sand wedge and a worst case scenario. So this is very conservative labor amount, again, using an average weekly um, service level and then you know, multiplying it out and, and see, that's how we came up with that calculation. We can be a little more liberal and you know, aggressive, um, but this was a worst case scenario of if 100% of the staff, um, and, and Sharon, it doesn't take into account where Thomas has the power if, if sales aren't, aren't happening, if we just don't see the movement, Thomas can send them, it's half the shift or, or two hours, I think is, the, is, the, is what we've been directed by HR, that he can send them home only paying for half the shift to two hours if it's a part-time. Um, so he has that, but that doesn't take into account that happening. This is a full, this budget is built right here as a full labor, everyone working, uh, the hours per week for the entire year. And again, a very conservative worst case scenario, I would say. So then what you're telling me is we have to increase revenue without increasing labor percent. Yes, and we have to, uh, revenue has to be driven up. You're, you're correct. Okay. And, and again, then we took a conservative approach on revenue. Um, and again, we can go back and say, if we want to get a little more aggressive with the revenue, we can, it, it that's, Right now, this budget is built very conservatively with conservative revenues and a worst case scenario on labor. So Thomas, I understand you do the scheduling, correct? I do. Okay, so when you're scheduling, are you scheduling based on your sales projections? Or? I am. Okay, i not necessarily My high points, my low, my low points. I, can't, I know the business, you know, on, on our Oh, I know you do, that's what right I'm, that's, yeah. I, the sandwich, I, I was right, watching, I was waiting a little bit to see if that was, you know, we launched it, we opened it in April. Right. I wanted to give it some time, and I thought, okay, summer, people are vacationing, people are away, let's see if we see the change in fall. So far, no, I haven't. Yeah. No, so I that understand. You tells me, because that, that, that facility could be run by one server alone. Right. And sometimes I know the concept, build it and they will come. You, you anticipate, and if it doesn't show up, then you start reacting appropriately. So I appreciate that and respect that very much. Thank you. Uh, the last financial statement. This, um, Go ahead, Ron. The last financial one ending August 31st, the last one I have, it shows a loss 
of 53,000. I'm sorry, but we can't hear you. If you get a little closer to your microphone, please. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> On the last financial statement in August, it shows a loss of $53,693. On the budget I see here, are you budgeting a loss of $41,394? So, in other words, we're going to improve $12,000 a month. The first thing I haven't seen would be, did we do that in September? I haven't seen those totals. Are you talking about changing the model in September for the staffing? I'm talking about, did the restaurant make money in September? And, and that, we are working on those financials right now. So I'll have those to you within the 10th business day this month. It never makes money. Uh, the figures I have, I show a 90% labor cost. I don't see how anybody can make any money with that much labor. And, and recall, I brought this up in the fact that this is an area where we're trying to serve everyone and put labor out in all these places. And we're gonna have to change our philosophy of I, and, and using Sharon's words, I, it's great, I want to be in the sandwich at one o'clock, but it isn't profitable for the club. And we have to change our way of thinking and, and change our business plan to say, I need to concentrate on the restaurant and the bar. And that's what Thomas just said, is that something we are looking now, if, if the board approves, we can implement this sooner this year, and then it will already be tied into the budget. But we, we are trying to be everything for everybody and it just doesn't work because all it does is it incurs costs. <laughs> incurs costs. That was somebody fainting. <laughs> Gee, what did you do? <laughs> but uh, it incurs costs but doesn't generate the significant income that we need. And so this is where we have to go back, change our business plan, and the <coughs> model that I put out for you on, of changing the sandwich is the first step in that. Also talked about banquets, and there needs to be sometimes a thought of, should we allow some outside banquets? We've done it in the past with City of Banning, um, the uh, chamber event, uh, the hospital. Should we do more? And how do we balance that with the needs of the members versus needs of the corporation for additional income? And that, that is a, a political piece as well. I, I think right now we, we just have to change the model of, and, uh, and straightforward honest, we cannot be everything to everyone. That has failed and we continue to go back to that well thinking it's going to change and it's not. We're going to have to get lean, we're going to have to focus on our points that do generate, I've said it in the fact meeting as well, the bar and banquets are the areas we should be focusing heavily on and supporting and adapt to that. That, that's where we need to go. Oh. Then, Chris, are we losing money on breakfast? We are losing money at breakfast, and that's, that's where uh, Thomas has talked about one uh, switching to one person only. Um, we, we lose it, and, and Ron, I look at it more of, of the area, not just the breakfast, because I staff that area into lunch, and, you know, I, I mean, so I may make money at the beginning, and then the revenues decline, but my cost is still up here. And so I go up, and then I head down, and I lose money. So I would say, rather than breakfast, I lose money in the sandwich component right now. Modifying it to an 8 to 11.30, one staff member, that should, should get it. Because the breakfast is also the cheapest, it, it's the lowest price, because it, it, there's a lower cost. It just um, you're, you're going to break even. You might make some money, um, but I think limiting it to 8 to 11.30 helps. And then push everyone into the restaurant. That allows also staff that if I have a staff member that's six hours, that staff member can move over from the sandwich into the restaurant, and I don't have to staff two people over here, four people here, one person here. Again, I can consolidate and focus on where I'm generating the most revenue. Something I'm seeing here, if we're losing $500,000 a year, that also means reserves are not getting that $500,000. It also means we're cutting one round 
one round of patrol. Mm -hmm. of the, these seem really very difficult choices, and I think on the times I've been on the committee, this thing loses money every month. $80,000 last in August. At some time, it should show again, I would think. I got, you know, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the uh, revenue side of the restaurant, and I see that you're projecting uh, in 2023, you're going to get 1.8 million in revenue. I look at the annualized uh, as of December 31st, and your uh, for your breakfast. Your annual ice is 172,000, and you're projecting that you're going to do 100,000 more next year. Okay, the lunch, your annual ice is 452, and you're projecting you're going to do another 72, uh, another 70,000 next year. Dinner, you're annualized at 327, and you're going to project that you're going to do another 228,000 next year. Uh, brunch, your annual ice at 67,000, and you're projecting you're going to do 100,000. Same thing with banquets, your annual ice at 152,000, you're going to basically double it. And I guess my question is, is that a realistic projection? And the reason I the reason I ask the question is when I look at the expense side, I see that the deficit's going to go from 412 to 496. So we're projecting, in, in my opinion, the revenue side is a little bit high in, in terms of the projection, and the expenses continue to grow so that we're now gonna have, we're budgeting for a half a million dollar loss. And I thought one of the things that we were gonna try and do is figure out a way to minimize our costs, and minimize the exposure of the, of, the, of the residents here, and I don't see that. We're, what we're doing is say, okay, we're going to get more, we're going to sell more food uh, that are somewhat, in my opinion, unrealistic projections, and our expenses are going to go up. The labor is going to increase 268,000 because we need to have these people so that nobody will poach them, and yet we're going to we're going to increase our deficit by eighty thousand dollars in the year. So I, I guess what the question is is, do you really and truly have? Uh, hard data to back up those proje projections. So remember the fallacy of annualizing is if something didn't happen in a first quarter or second quarter, it's going to throw off the, the projections. Uh, breakfast wasn't started until May. When did we start? Uh, so you've already lost some of your banquets, the same thing. So what we actually had to do is go back to 2018 when there was solid statistics. We weren't, we were open. <laughs> We weren't closed because of renovations. We weren't closed because of COVID. So the best year to go back to was 2018. How much and did we lose that year? I'd have to go and pull that. I don't. You, you went back to 2018 for the revenue number. I did. Where's the expense numbers? Well, then the expenses, the food costs were different. We used the revenue number for where we were serving on covers. Then there's an increase in cost because items that were you know, 888 in 2018 are not going to be that price. And so that takes into account price change as well as getting back to service level where we were in the prior year. The expense side of it is you're looking at real food and beverage worst case scenario. Again, we can get, if the board says get more aggressive with that, we can, we can, we can do that. There's just the concern is then we have to follow up with the plan and implement a plan that I'm not going to be everything to everyone, that I've got to be targeted not only on the staff, but that also will then go into the cost of food. It will also go into some of the supplies as well because I'm targeted. I'm not trying to be everywhere at all times. And so, I again, conservative revenue based on a 2018 level. Expenses are built on a 2022-2023 level based on where we're seeing right now. So I, I don't think we have to go back to 2018 expenses and see what was the labor cost there because it, it's changed. Uh, we can use today's pricing for the plastics, the, um, the, the supplies that are the non-cost of goods sold, and then we can use today's prices for cost of goods sold. But the revenue side of looking at what was I hitting on covers 
during that time of 2018 when everything was going great, I believe you can rely on that as data of where we were at one time and we were successful. Let's move forward with that same methodology of using those covers. You're, you're asking us to realistically rely on the data here that's going to require almost a million dollar turnaround in what we're doing uh, in the meal categories. Right now we're supposed to lose about uh, $500,000, okay? The difference between that and what you're projecting for 2023 is a million two. And you expect us to believe that that's a realistic, you're gonna be able to do a million two turnaround? That is the expectation in the budget. The board can, and along with the recommendations from the fact, if we wanna pull those numbers down, we can. Chris, if I can ask you a question, when you are looking, when you go back to 2018 and you talk about looking at the revenue, are you talking about looking at the money or the covers? Are you talking about looking at how many people actually walk through the door? We're, we're looking at the covers when we're fully open. Okay, so if you take those covers of 100 for well, lunch on whatever and apply the costs in this moment to those covers, would that then give you a, a realistic idea of what we could make if all those people walked in our door? Right, and that's where we're looking at. Is that at, what these numbers are? Okay, at, thank you. Are you done, Dad? Are you done? I have a question. Okay. Um, I, I, hope, I heard you both talk about scheduling. I mean, uh, and I'm, I'm curious, uh, was, uh, when Joe Johnson came on, he's the food and beverage manager now, is that correct? Yes. That's so correct. What is his role in the restaurant? <laughs> so it, do you want to answer? You want, well, actually, it's your department. I'll let you answer That's what okay. Joe, what Joe's purpose is. Joe? Uh, Joe, the, uh, my front assistant? Of, front of the house manager. His purpose is he's, he's the eyes of the dining room. He's the front of the house manager. Because if Thomas is stuck in the kitchen trying to mediate working somebody else's job, which I pretty much do every night of the week, being expo and trying to get all the food out, hot food to the tables, then there's nobody out managing the dining room or watching what's happening with the front of the house operations. Well, I'm not questioning whether it's important to, to have him. I, feel, I think in, in my experience in the restaurant, I've seen him out in front of the house a lot. But as we've said, and other people seem to be saying, the fertile ground is to um, better manage labor costs. And again, labor costs, there's some standards in the industry, but labor costs at, at close to 90% is excessive. My suggestion or my question, would it make sense? And I'm confused by, you know, uh, Chris talked about managing the schedule, you talked about managing the schedule, and now we have a new food and beverage manager. I don't know how many people you can have work on the schedule. But my suggestion or question, would it make sense to provide some incentive to Joe, for example, to better manage the labor cost? Because the labor cost is a fertile ground. We, you're projecting a, a million eight in revenue. If you cut labor costs by 10%, that's $180,000. And I believe that 70% is even an, a, a high labor percentage for a restaurant. Sir, we can we can cut back on labor costs, but that's also going to cut back on service. So people will have to people will have to wait a little bit longer, and people will have to understand that if there's not an extra server on the floor, they're going to have to wait for service. Well, I think the community understands that the restaurant is losing money, and it's a concern. So, and I agree with you. You can't have it both ways. Right. But what I'm saying is, maybe it makes sense to. Have Joe, who's new, is that a new position or would he be replaced on the board? No, we re we've had that position, that, that position replaced Shannon, who was here before. Okay. Well, he seems to be the person with the feet on the ground. Yeah. And I, it would make sense to me to offer him some incentive to la uh, manage labor costs, to bring the labor costs down and give him some incentive to do that. Sure. I mean, that would if, be a decision of the may. board to if they wanted to go that. We typically haven't done that, but again, the board would have to. If, if I may, um, having managed multi-restaurants, 
it was really simple. It wasn't so much an incentive. It was, here's your labor budget, make it work. It's just that simple. I understand, Thomas, totally, that you have an expectation that's set by this board or by this community, and I think that's what needs to be managed. One, we all have to understand, as a community, we're in this together. Mm -hmm. And we're all talking about late managing controllables. Let's talk about increasing revenue. Let's talk about people coming out, supporting this amenity, and supporting the community by coming to the restaurant, coming to the lounge, hit the pool when it's open, hit, hit the veranda, come to the events. I think, Thomas, you've done a great job trying to manage labor with buffet events because you require less labor when you have buffet events. You have two a week now, which I think is right. fabulous. So I think you're trying really hard, and I appreciate it. And I know the Restaurant and Lounge Committee is supporting of you in what you're doing. But I think, again, I'm just going to keep shouting it, and you're going to hear it when I do different videos or whatnot. People, we need to support our own community. Let's focus more on increasing the revenue so that the labor percent won't be an issue. And if I can just tag on to that a little bit, um, that's part of the reason I think that we're looking at consolidating, because consolidating is going to allow us to be much more effective with less labor. We're going to be able to provide the service that people want in the lounge, in the restaurant, when we don't have the sand wedge open to take people away, when we don't have a server trying to run to and fro from the pool. So we can really focus in with that condensation that you guys are talking about doing. And I really think that's a good idea because we, people want to come in and they don't want to wait. They want to come in, they want to be acknowledged, they want to be served, and then they're happy and they keep coming back. So it's that continual role of it, and I'm, I'm with you, come in, we're all in this together. I'll buy you a drink the next time I see you in the lounge. Only one of you, though. <laughs> I have a question uh, to support. Kind of tag, tagging on to what Dan was saying and comments relative to sales. Uh, I've done quite a bit of uh, trending analysis and looking at sales in particular as well as some of the other key characteristics for the lounge and the restaurant since 2019. Um, this may come across as a negative initially, but it's really not. If we look at uh, 2022 budget to actual uh, Thomas has done a great job of resurrecting the restaurant and the lounge from the COVID death. Um, you've done a great job of that. But if we go back and look at trends, the restaurant has only made their sales budget uh, once this month, uh, actually the lounge made it once this month and uh, once in 2019. The restaurant has not made the sales budget at all in 2000, uh, 2022 and it never made the sales budget in 2019. So to increase the sales budget without a plan on trying to do that, I think is uh, unrealistic as far as sales go. And if we don't have the sales, we're obviously gonna have the same problem with uh, high la higher labor costs than anticipated if we staff for a fully uh, operational sales budget. The thing that uh, I, I see missing is that in attending the restaurant uh, and communications and marketing committee meetings, uh, there is a fair degree of frustration that they're not involved enough where they can make, uh, do any help to get people into the restaurant. As an example, we did Taco Tuesday and Taco Thursday, and there was absolutely nothing in the prior month's uh, lifestyles and uh, the Facebook page. We have seven, only have 1,700 people out of 5,000 people online looking at the Facebook page. There was no advertising for that as well. Uh, we're now coming up with a new activity for uh, Saturday in November, first, first week in November for the uh, Greek night. And I don't see any advertising other than the, the 1,700 participants looking at the uh, Facebook page. So what seems to me is that we have an opportunity here to really crank up the sales in this place, which it, it, it applies to golf too. Golf at our last meeting had ideas of things that they w were going to do uh, for non-golfers, but that's not communicated. So I think that what we really need is a written policy and procedure manual addressing marketing. And what that could address is how are we gonna communicate with all of these great committees? We have a great uh, marketing and communication. We have a great uh, restaurant advisory committee, but we're not really utilizing them the way we could. 
Uh, if we had a written procedure and policy, we would know who's going to communicate what to each of each other, uh, what we're going to communicate as far as activities, when we're going to do it, and where we're going to share that information so that all the residents in this community get to know what's going on, not just the 1700 on the uh, Facebook page. And we also have two Facebook pages that we could take advantage of. You know, Bob Murray and the team have done an outstanding job of getting us electronically communicating to one another, but we still don't have the whole residents participating in that. So Thomas can come up with the best menu in the world, which I think he's doing a great job of. Um, we need to look at possibly the pricing of the menu for those that aren't coming and share with the people that aren't coming what the heck's going on because we're not doing that and it's a great opportunity. So I don't know, Chris, do you, do you think a written procedure policy to e expand uh, how we're going to do marketing and what we're going to market and when we're going to market it is an idea? Well, I think the committee would have to work on that with the direction from the board because the committee works for the board. So the, that well, the, the committee is only an advisory committee. Mm -hmm. You've got a management company managing this facility. You also have management people that work for you in the restaurant. You know, I, I know that the committees are anxious to get information and to help that. Um, I had a conversation at the last restaurant advisory committee meeting and uh, I could sense the frustration because I said, hey, we got to get this thing going. And they said, well, we're trying, man, but we, we didn't know anything about Taco Tuesday or uh, Italian Thursday. So there was nothing mentioned in the, the restaurant's advisory uh, article in the magazine, and there was nothing on the Facebook page because nobody knew in enough detail what was actually going to happen. So um, I would say you guys need to take the lead. You're the management uh, of this whole operation. And I know the advisory committees are there to help you, and they will help you. I know it as long as we get together and come up with a plan. We don't have a plan right now. Yeah, D Dan makes some um, some good points, and um, we appreciate uh, the comments. I think other board members wanted to uh, also yeah, comment. Just, Randy? Yeah, just quickly. Um, I, ran, I ran a bunch of numbers over the weekend, and I, I, <coughs> I like to look at the whole food and beverage as, as one entity. Rather, I, I know there's basically three entities, but I like to look at it as one. That's what I've always done. And through the first eight months of 2022, we are currently running at 134%. So that's a dollar 34 per dollar spent, excuse me, per, per revenue dollar that we are spending. This new budget is at 121.40%. Uh, are, is it realistic that we're going to knock, without even getting into the, the debate about breaking even or not, is it realistic that we're going to knock 13% off with some of these proposed changes? So I would say so okay. the, the labor piece of it. <laughs> Sorry. I'm kicking the wires, that's why. And I think the, the transition of the, again, the theme right now is the consolidation. And I think one area where we can see that. and. We can, you know, I was just thinking what Thomas had said in one of the responses is, we can even pull leaner in the restaurant to see how the repercussions of that, meaning uh, it change from a one to six, one staff member to six table ratio, and increase that one to eight, mm -hmm. and see what effect will, will happen. I think that, yeah. that's what, what Thomas, so I think in, in labor you can do that, and we can get leaner, and then see what, what impact and you know, from there. And if I could just make one comment, Don, on what you were talking about, a little off topic here because we are talking about the restaurant and lounge, but just a reminder, the management company works at the direction of the master board, not the other way around. So we would be the one to direct them for whatever they're going to do. But you're bringing up a very valid point, and I've had a conversation with several residents about communications and marketing, and Bob as well, and that is something we'll be talking about at the next exec. Thank you. Yes, Ron. Uh, some comments on uh, the pers uh, how we're budgeting and percentages. Uh, and the fact that the combination of labor and food is more than 100%. Uh, uh, first of all, labor is semi-variable and is not totally variable. And I think 
Uh, as I understand it, we're budgeted for a max. Uh, so we've put labor up to a max, which I agree with because if we budget uh, at lower than that, uh, the, any increase in sales will increase losses. And by having labor uh, being at the max is a proper thing to do. However, uh, and you've heard me comment on this many, many times, that once the budget is established, that establishes the amount of cash that is available for uh, the HOA. And in the past when, uh, and I know it's a conundrum on uh, the restaurant, but when the restaurant has not been able to operate within the budget, that variance becomes a use of cash that we do not have. Uh, we started this year with about 900,000 in the HOH uh, cash account. It's down to 400 and something. Went down 100,000 in August. Looks to me like it will continue to go down. So we need to address the budget uh, in such a manner that one, there's some flexibility, and two, uh, we need to, and I know uh, Thomas, you, and Chris, and Jason work hard at this, but what flexibility and what remedial actions you can take to operate within whatever the budget is for the restaurant and lounge. So, thank you. Thank you. A any other um, comments? Before you yeah, move on to the next section, any other comments for? My question is, is very closely related. It's not just for food and beverage. And uh, first, let me tell you, Thomas, I'm loving the restaurant. <laughs> Just me. I, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at my finger. Sorry. Uh, in relation to the question that was just made over here, uh, it's an accounting question. Cash flow is down. The availability of cash and accounts receivable, the ratio of, of accounts receivable and cash over accounts payable is underwater. What are we doing to fix that? So what, and I think I provided a document to the board and to the committee that where it came from, from the 2019 and 2020, where that uh, cash, the extra cash we had uh, to float or whatever, uh, was diminished during those two years. And so going forward, as I put in, we either, we have to set the budgets to be uh, a, basically a, a realistic budget. We also then have to look long-term of how do I get back that extra amount? How do I make up for those prior year losses in the future years? And there are options either through the budget process or through... Chris, don't go there. Please, don't go there. Um, I because, mentioned the question. Because the data that you're going to talk about is incorrect. So 2019 and 2020, we didn't have a loss. You had a loss, but the loss, the cash loss was in starting in May of 2020 when the board directed First Service to pay down the debt that operations that. owed to reserves. You paid actually, down one point two million. Actually if I go May, back if Chris, I go back I mean, to the presentation Chris, that Linda did in November that, when she that was that presentation is erroneous. That, it, that it's presentation not. is erroneous. I've got the data right in front of me now if you need it. From May of twenty twenty until October of twenty twenty one, first service paid down what operations owed to reserves. If you go back and look at the up uh, the uh, October balance sheet, you'll see that there was a zero due to reserves in CIP. It was all a result of the monthly decrease every month from May of 2020 to October of 2021. That's where the cash went. I respectfully disagree because you go back to 2019 and you'll see a loss of close to 900,000 directly attributable and Don Day can justify that because he did an analysis of labor and saw labor out of control in 2019 versus the revenues that were generated. So okay, the loss so generated, the genesis is 2019, moving into 2020 with the pandemic. Those years we've never recovered from the cash. There was never a special assessment. There was never an increase in assessment to cover those losses. We kept moving forward. That's the problem we're in now. 
that goes to Steve's, how do I handle it now? And either I'm going to do a realistic budget, I'm gonna to have to try to incorporate recouping 2019 and 2020 in the budget, or do something with the assessments in the future to recoup. Where in this budget is the excess that you're gonna recoup the cash from? There is no excess in this, this is tight. Well, we, we have a difference of uh, opinion interpretation, but we're going to go ahead and, and move on with the rest of our, uh, I, pre our presentation now. Can I ask one question? Sure. I mean, why wouldn't it make sense? I mean, I understand you have a tight budget, but we've all, also talked about potentially ways to reduce expenses or increase revenue. But the budget, as I see it, is a break-even budget. There's, it doesn't account for any way to recoup the losses for previous years. Previous years, the budget was a break-even budget, but every year over the last three years, it's uh, had a deficit. You know, the overall deficit over the last three years is over a million dollars. So it, it seems to me there has to be something in the budget to rebuild the operating accounts. Mm -hmm. and. The one thing that, and I'm not, uh, it's not a criticism, but I, what I see is that First Service provides some lakes with a line of credit because uh, the amount due uh, First Service has been as high as $800,000, and that doesn't make sense. I mean, it's you call it a crude payroll on the balance sheet, but if it's eight hundred thousand dollars, it's it's at least two months' payroll, and I, I understand it's been worked down, but it's still five hundred thousand dollars. And as Steve said, and this is about as simple as you can make it, when you look at the bank account and accounts receivable, and compare that with AP, we're upside down. So I, I, let me. I just want to finish. Go, go. Uh, I believe that there has to be something in the budget that is a bill that causes um, a replenishment of the, of the operating account. So I would call it um, recovery of the deficit mm -hmm. or uh, recovery of working capital, but we're on the edge, at least and, and as an organization, I, I think that's pretty scary. Thank you. Any, any other comments? I just want to support what he's saying. I appreciate this board's desire to have the lowest HOA fee increase possible, but I think we have to look at exactly what he's saying in that we have got to continue to grow the operational fund to a healthier level to replace the loss. So it has to be considered seriously. I would rather pay a little bit each year now than be hit with a special assessment down the road in three years that I can't afford. Thank you, Sharon. I know we've had increases the last couple of years that have been higher, but I agree with you. We don't want to cut off our nose to spite our face. We want to make sure that we have a realistic um, increase, and there will be an increase, and I know we were, we were trying to keep it low, and we still are, but we don't want to cut our throats when we do that. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, to do what you're proposing is illegal. Davis Sterling says you build a budget that will have exactly the same amount of expenses as what your revenue is. You cannot build into your budget uh, a slush fund is basically what you're saying. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm disagreeing with you, I guess. I mean, well, uh, let's say the organization had a loan. How would it pay back the loan? Because that's what it has. It has a loan from first service. So if you have a loan, you have to put into your budget pay down the principal. But, uh, I guess my, uh, the, rather than increase the HOA, which I know nobody wants to do, and I agree with that, I think the charge is to reduce expenses. But, we, but uh, uh, the cash account and the due to the first service needs to go down. Thank you. Any other comments? Chris, did you, or Chris, I'm sorry. I know you and I discussed this. On this financial, I know Mitch, much of this uh, that we look at and that he's handed out to the audience and available online, there are contractual obligations. That are, there is no negotiation. There is no changing any of it. So did you ever go about kind of marking so people understand, well, 
that does seem high. We're contractually obligated to that. Wait, go, go over that. Sure, okay, you lost so, me just a little bit. Okay, so an example I'll use, um, I'll let, we can't, well, I know they're actually working on the utilities, but utilities are typically set. There's not a negotiation yeah, plan right, on those. Right, right, and right. So, go ahead, I'm sorry. Or spectrum, or anything that we're contractual. Yeah, you know, spectrum was the one I was thinking you were. Landscaping, patrol, they're all contractual at this that point. That is correct. So those have no room to, to adjust. So in, in people, when they're evaluating the budget, knowing that these are set items that I cannot adjust would be helpful possibly, and then better, better understanding where can adjustments be made, where are they set. That, that's all. And, and Sharon, I think one of the, where you're going, I, I, I agree that this, you know, it's, it's, it's easier, you know, a, a Mark Schleiden's department, uh, Etanisla, um, recreation, uh, it's easier to budge, budget those because you can achieve those realistic things. Um, the restaurant, it's variable in the budget because you raise prices, you know the first three months your revenues are going to go down. Even though you've raised prices, the patronage will go down. That historically has happened here. And so we, we have a, an issue with how we budget if, you know, that's why we take into account the worst case scenario with labor because there's a fear that we raise prices in the first three months we have people there and they're, they're, we're not generating the revenue. So that, that's a big variable. I think we would all agree that food and beverages is the one area that is, is the nut that we're trying to, to crack on, on this. Golf, I think we, we've talked about it. Ron Varner has come up with solutions in the past. Um, but we can go through this and it kind of say what adjustment or what are areas we can go back to. Schleiden's already done that very well in his department of saying the line is going to stop on this contract. We're not changing it. Um, but Spectrum is another thing where that's going to continue going up. And they don't want to renegotiate. Can I ask about insurance? Um, I'm seeing that your budget, uh, in 2021, the insurance, and I understand this is administrative, but the insurance was $278,000. And if you take uh, and project out uh, 2022, it's, it looks like it's going to be somewhere near 400000 That's a 52% increase. Now, the budget you have for 2023 is, is $386,000, which is still over $100,000 over 2021. Mm -hmm. now, I'm just looking for uh, some explanation or it would be useful, I guess, to ask the question, uh, is there any way to reduce that? No, good good that. question. <laughs> that, that is a very good question. And, and unfortunately, liability <coughs> uh, insurance is a big driver. Uh, the more times members sue the association, the insurance puts that on the record and says how many times we're a fris fri frivolous lawsuit. Um, there's a couple you'll be getting an updated um, legal um, disclosure coming out. Um, what, what sets it is we've seen just uh, an increase in, in some lawsuits, members suing the association. That puts it on the insurance, and then they look at it to say, is that a risk or not? When we shop it, you have your history there that is then given to all the prospective um, insurance providers, and they can then assess, should we do it or, or not? Uh, the other area that we're seeing is because uh, state of California fire map changed especially on the areas of um, Breckenridge and areas then they say, well, there's a potential loss there with common area because uh, there's a risk of fire and that the fire truck can't get there in time. So the insurance looks at it as the risks have gone up year over year and that is reflective in the premiums that are charged to us. Well, I guess my uh, suggestion is if, you, if we have a, a contract or a procurement committee you have a finance committee, would it make sense to take a closer look at the insurance, maybe charge those committees? I'm not, I, I've heard you say that they renew in November, so mm -hmm. it's probably not time this year, but I think it's something that you should look at because there are creative ways to approach insurance. And um, it's, it's obviously it's an expense that's increasing exponentially. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
I, I, I agree. Many, many communities, that's one of the biggest things that they look at is the uh, significant increase in insurance, and, and we're going to be reviewing that here, too. Uh, no more, no more questions. Report. As uh, Chris alluded to, he's gone all the way back to 2018 to look at trends and see how that's going to affect the 2023 budget. I noticed in going through this that you're proposing to change uh, the labor reporting uh, and move some of the labor from the lounge to the restaurant. Uh, why are we doing that? Do we have to do that? I, I get very concerned when we lose trend analysis ability because of making changes. Well, the, the problem is that the bartenders, we can, we can isolate them. They know they work at the bar. What is happening is, is our methodology of how do you classify a server? Are they a cocktail server that's just serving lounge? You just heard Beverly, she eats in the lounge, and what we've seen is more people will dine in there pulling a server from the restaurant to go into the lounge. Now, we may say, well, if it's in the lounge, anything within the lounge in a labor piece, that's got to be labeled lounge. Uh, this budget is built on bartenders are in the lounge. They are, they're the, the fixed cost there. I mean, it's variable, but uh, they're the fixed assignment to that uh, um, department. Uh, we've put, because servers, bussers, who also service the restaurant will service the lounge. Well, their base department is the restaurant. And so that's why the, the budget, you would, you would have to do um, almost a, 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 an individual tracking on their time card to say, I spent X amount of time in the lounge so charge that, allocate that amount of time to the lounge. I mean, we, we can do it. It was difficult to do that. Gino, use your so, mic, please. So Gino, that's a, that's a good question. The POS system right now, it captures the person and where they logged in at. So if they are logged in at the bar, they are showing up as the bar. So you could say, okay, I need a portion of it, of that time, but and I've explained this to Sharon. We do not use the POS system for timekeeping. The POS system belongs to the association. ADP is the service first service uses, and first service requires that people log into ADP. Our ADP does not talk to the POS system, and the POS system does not talk to ADP because those are two separate entities. So we have to rely on ADP for the timekeeping. That's why. You remember the days when Sherry was here, she'd have to go to ADP, whole labor summary, she'd have to go to the POS for sales, then have to go to a different thing to mine data to form a report. We're still in that environment. The POS system will do great on hours, service, but it's a timekeeping function. It is not being utilized. The servers will log in, and I can grab servers, but I won't grab cooks, um, uh, the bussers. They would have to log in. And right now, the prior priority has been, and to be honest, the priority is ADP to make sure I'm getting their meal breaks in, I don't have any penalties. And so we um, police the ADP more than we do the POS on the timekeeping. So we don't really rely on the timekeeping piece of the POS system. So if I understand you correctly, Chris, we're not cutting service in the lounge, we're just assigning all the servers to one location Correct. of the restaurant, Correct. wherever they serve. Right. So we're not cutting the service. Right, the service okay. isn't cut. It's just their home department is where we look at, and, and they're based out of the restaurant. Okay. Bussers, cooks, and the servers. And anytime a server, let's use Leo, for example. Leo will be an expo restaurant. He'll then run to be a server in the lounge. Well, now he's doing lounge work, but he's still classified as a restaurant. Thank you. So what we're going to do, what we're going to do now, what, what we're going to do now is we're going to have comments from the. It's, we have like eight minutes left to our, our presentation, and we'd like the audience to be able to also participate and, and interact. So uh, keep your comments to um, uh, three minutes, and, and make sure that it pertains to our, our specific uh, budget discussions today. And. Uh, Beverly will go around with a uh, microphone so you can be, you can be heard. Uh, please identify yourself. Thank you. 
Hello, my name hello, my name is Tom Boyle. I live at five zero zero two Mission Hills Drive. And I just wanted to go along with Mr. Day's comment about we don't do a good you need to get my money out of my pocket into your pocket to make this whole thing successful. And I don't think we do a good job of that. One of the things I heard about Taco Tuesday was you're gonna get two tacos for seventeen dollars. I heard that all over the place until so they found out the truth. I came up on the first Monday for football, and I saw your football menu. I hadn't heard anything about it. Great menu. I looked at the food. It was great. I looked at the prices on my chair. Nobody knows about that. I don't think we do a good job of advertising what we do up here. You're relying on a lot of people who are retired doing the electronic business. Facebook. Well, that doesn't work at all. Uh, Mr. Day, you rely on one book, one a month to sell it. That's all work. We need to get your committees involved and do a better job of selling what you do. If we don't know it, we can't buy it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ajit Desai uh, from Rory Pines. Uh, very good discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, I commend both the board as well as the administration for reducing the assessment increase from 14 and a half to six and a half. And uh, um, I have an idea which you may not, which if correct, you may have overlooked. And um, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I do wanna uh, talk about a subject that has, has not been discussed so far, which may um, eliminate the need for even assessments. And unless, unless I'm wrong, and I know Chris will correct me, your investment income uh, so far, it was 48,000. On a prorated basis, it comes to 73,000. If uh, looking at, uh, at the budget, it shows 109,000 for this year budgeted. Next year is 142,000. If you take 109,000, that's about 0.6% on your portfolio of 13 million. But right now, as of an hour ago, the treasury rates were 4.1% for two years, 3.3% for three months. So if you just you know, uh, liquidated your entire portfolio, paid whatever interest you were getting this year, and reinvested it in two-year treasuries, you would get a 4.1% interest while you might be docked for about 05 interest at most. And I don't even know if that's true. But essentially, if you did that, your investment income on a 13 million portfolio would be $520,000, which is $380,000 more than what you have in the budget, which would be about $9.50 in assessments. So essentially, it covers not just the assessment, but you can even reduce the assessment, you know, give back money. So that was one comment. The other comment is, uh, two, three comments. One is that I find it kind of strange that we spent about an hour talking about restaurant uh, budget when the loss there is about half a million and no time at all on golf, which has a one and a half million dollar loss to two and a half million, depending on how you compute it. Uh, the third thing I wanted to mention very quickly is that uh, I mentioned this several times, you know, we. See, there is a lot of discussion here, and I think that discussion is going to go year after year without a resolution. And the problem is, you know, right now you're stuck in this rut where you have high food costs and labor costs compared to as a percent of, of sales. And it's about 124% to 100, more recently maybe 115%. Okay, but still a lot. And the only solution that I see, and I have tried to put it forward in the presentation that I made to almost about, about 100 people, is you have to increase your revenues very significantly. I see a lot of things that are being done, they are of incremental benefit. So in fact, you have sales increases going from one and a half to 1.8 million. What you really need is an overarching strategy, and I mentioned this to Bob and Laurie many times, you need a strategy which will get you to two and a half million in revenue, almost doubling it, maybe even three million, and then 
at that point, you will stop talking about all these labor costs and all that because then you'd have, and you'll be in a profit situation, and it is doable. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marsha Midget. I just have one, well, actually I have a couple things, but the first thing is, with Artistic doing the street cleaning during the winter, which is fine, um, come summertime when they're back to their full schedule, what's going to happen to the streets? So why not have um, street sweeping maybe twice a month instead of every week? Go back to the same same, maybe a different company or something that will use the water. But I walk every day. The streets look terrible. And there's a lot of debris on sidewalks. I'm just waiting for someone to slip and fall on some of the pine needles that are on the sidewalks or even in the street. And then talk about the insurance going up because someone sues us. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is the community patrol. We have. Um, in the past, we reduced uh, patrols, but in the middle of the year, we went back up with another patrol. And so I'm really concerned about the lack of or re reduction in services for the community. And then um, repair and replacement. I know we have plans for uh, money going in there. How much have we deferred this year? And what's that's going to cost us in the future to go and pay a higher price for things that we've deferred this year? So those are my three comments. Bob Hicks. I live on the north side. Um, I don't want to bring up a whole bunch of issues that have been brought up here, but I just wanted to make a kind of an overarching comment that there are tons of good ideas that have been expressed here by people that have a lot of skill and insight. But what I have never seen since I've moved to Sun Lakes is any effort or emphasis placed on something that Agent referred to, but in the context of a single item, the overarching strategy for our community. Where is it? Problems cannot be solved piecemeal. Problems cannot be solved effectively by trying this and then trying that in the absence of them being part and parcel of an overarching strategic plan. So please consider that. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, yes, good morning. I'm uh, Gail Martin in District 12. I uh, want to thank the board and the committee for all their hard work and effort and time they put into this. Uh, we do have a very nice uh, set of handouts, uh, which we greatly appreciate. Uh, I was wondering what the time scale is on uh, the paper that refers to the things that are uh, regarding reserves. There's a, Thank there's you. a handout that has, uh, it's a bar chart. It has yellow, green, and red. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, what that shows is what were the uh, projected contributions in 2023. I think that's yellow. And the green is the projected expenses. And the red is... It doesn't show the years. The, I, okay. I, I'm trying to understand what each well, group of... Well, if I had of, a, because we had so many comments, we didn't have time to go over it today. So what that does is for, for starting in 2023 through 2029, that shows what we're going to have in terms of our shortfall on the contributions. To summarize, we're going we're to contribute uh, $17 million dollars over the next seven years, we're gonna spend uh, $23 million over so that same time period. So we have a $6 million shortfall. That's all that chart is gonna, is gonna show you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? We do have one more. I just wanna re-endorse what this lovely lady has said. I also wanna compliment you on this very difficult process that you go through every year to set how much money we're gonna pay every month. And I think what we need to do is we need to educate our village people just how much work you guys do. The more education I know about what you do, the less I'll complain. <laughs> but go back to what Don was saying. 
in order for you to exist, you gotta get this green back out of my pocket into your coffers. And if I don't know what you're selling, I'm not gonna buy it. Thank you. Any, any comments from the board before we, uh, uh, we adjourn? I just wanna say one thing. There were a couple comments from, from the audience which were fantastic. And you commented that, that we're working on our budget. No, this is everybody's budget. This is everyone's budget. This is the community, those at home, everybody. This is the entire budget for everybody, not just the board, not just the FAC, not just management. Thank you. Thank you. So in, in conclusion, the, um, just be aware of the fact that draft number four came in with a projected increase of $6.67. Uh, we're still working in the range between what our beginning goal was between four and 14. We have not set a specific number. We're still working on that. You know, there, there's, we do want to uh, commit some more to the uh, reserve and replacement. Uh, we're also considering doing a, uh, uh, an increase for staff wages. So we're, you know, we're, we're looking to uh, uh, make this, you know, the fairest uh, and, and the, uh, the best budget that will not significantly uh, impact our people that have been here for a long time. We don't want a, a large double, double digit uh, increase again. And we've been going through you know, many, many contracts, reviewing everything we can, cutting where we can. And uh, you know, there is a major problem with uh, you know, staffing and, and staff costs, we realize that. And uh, we're gonna be looking at that before we come up with the number, but the number will be uh, uh, probably in the range from uh, a total of uh, uh, four to 14, you know, probably closer to 11 if you're trying to figure out, for, for, yeah, but nine according to Dan, but between nine, nine to 11. If you're trying to figure out your budget for next year, that's, the board still is working on that hard number. But, but at least you know, you know the direction that, that we're headed. And thank everybody for, for coming out today and I appreciate your input. We're adjourned. <laughs>